Thank you all for coming. I'd like to now introduce Ellen Miller to get us started. Hello, everyone. My name is Ellen Miller, and I'm the secretary of the, Maine, the board of the Maine Women's Conference. I would like to welcome you all to this event tonight. And it's our August installment of our 2021 We Are Me interview series. The mission of the Maine Women's Conference is to draw women together to connect, educate, inspire, and empower one another to assume new and expanded roles in the workforce, in our lives, and in the community. Conceived against that mission, our virtual We Are Me series features gritty, determined, and inspirational <laughs> women who will share their stories, the lessons they have learned, and their words of wisdom. Tonight, we are very excited to be talking with Susan Rodriguez, an award-winning architect who will tell us all about her history with Maine, her architectural life story, and the recent work she's doing with Maine organizations. Throughout our conversation with Susan, we encourage you to connect with fellow attendees, to share your thoughts via the chat function. We'd also love to get to know you better. So we'll be putting up a couple of polls, starting now with our first one. Tell us, is this your first Maine Women's Conference event? So again, thank you for being here and for attending our events. Just a quick reminder, our 2021 Maine Women's Conference is scheduled for November 8th to November 10th. And early bird tickets are on sale now. This will be a virtual event, so please be sure to share it with your friends near and far. As a note, we will reserve time to answer questions at the end of the interview. Please submit all questions using the Q&A function at the bottom of your screen. Now, I'd like to turn it over to my fellow board member, Nancy Kogelmeyer, to kick off the interview. Thank you, Ellen. And welcome, Susie. On behalf of the Maine Women's Conference, I wanted to let you know we really appreciate your taking the time tonight to chat with us. Um, as we've been sharing in our promotional posts for this interview, you are, as you know, a very accomplished and respected architect. Um, and we also know that you've lived your adult life with your husband, raised your son, and accomplished great things in the architectural world of New York City. But if New York City was the end of the story, we wouldn't be chatting tonight because this is called We Are Maine. <laughs> so what we also know is that you have an intersecting story of summers spent in Maine. Um, when you were a young girl, but accelerating as an adult. Um, and recently you've con completed three architectural design projects right here in the state of Maine. Um, quoting your bio and sharing this with, with our listeners, to each project Susan brings a longstanding personal connection with and appreciation for the rich history and culture of Maine, inspired by summers spent in an off-grid cabin in a small island in the Penobscot Bay. Pretty cool. So we get to learn all about this tonight. Um, so let's dive right in, but start sort of at the beginning, which is at the point when you received an undergraduate degree from Cornell University in architecture and went on to get a master's degree from Columbia University. So 40-ish years ago, mm -hmm. following the path of architecture was not a paved path for a young woman. So perhaps you could give us a little bit of an understanding of what motivated uh, you to go in that direction at that time. Sure, well, thank you so much, Nancy, for having me. I wish I was in Maine right now, but I will be on Saturday, oh. um, which can't wait. It's um, as my, one of my sisters calls it, my happy place. Mm -hmm. And it's like, as all of you who spend more time than I, um, that's my goal to spend more time in Maine. Um, anyway, um, architecture, how did I get there? Um, sometimes I think my mom wanted to be an architect. And so I'm the oldest of four daughters and I um, somehow always had a, I guess, a, a lot of a creative uh, soul uh, in me. And so, and I love to draw um, and I, um, also did, I, I, I always was interested in architecture. So 
I would sneak into job sites in my neighborhood <laughs> with a friend and then we draw the plans and all sorts of things. But I think I really cemented the interest when I went to Cornell actually in high school for a summer program. And you know, for anybody who is in, interested in architecture, a number of colleges and universities around the country actually have those high school programs to step your toe into something to see if it is of interest. And I did that and I not only loved the architecture, but I also loved um, Cornell. And so that was sort of, I was determined that's where I was going to go. So um, that's really where it all started for me. Oh, that's very cool. That's yeah. very cool. Um, so your bio describes what I would call your professional sweet spot as the intersection of architecture and the public realm. Can you help those of us who are not from your world understand what that means and, and where did this interest come from? Um, architecture and the public realm. It's designing all the places that we come together as a community. Whether you're in New York City or you're in Maine, it's um, schools and museums, courthouses, places that are more, um, yeah, about gathering, also about celebrating um, kind of public life. And, you know, for me, it's been an amazing opportunity for, you know, really more than, I guess, close to 40 years to be engaged in working with great leaders, great people who have these dreams but need architects to translate them into the reality. So whether it was the Sinatra High School for the Arts or the housing for formerly homeless and HIV AIDS, this is at the Brooklyn Museum. Um, I just, I feel I've been so fortunate. Um, this is a really important project. This is uh, for tonight in that it's a center for feminist art. And, you know, this was where I felt extremely uh, prepared as a woman <laughs> to design this space. But, you know, I think when you're working in the public realm, you really have to think a lot about and be curious about the place. Um, and that I always think of design in some ways as portraiture and it's about place intersecting with program and people and culture. And the more you know about what that is and what's wanting to be accomplished, then you can really create something unique and special. Um, for uh, that community. This is a project, um, you know, many of these are ones I've done over the years, but I'm doing this now in Central Park and it's in the Northern part of the park at the Harlem Near Center. And it's just actually starting construction, which is, this is a dream come true project um, that I actually have been working on now for four years. Wow. So, but that's really where we, you know, when you're working in the public realm, um, that you become what I never thought when I went to school is to become a public person too. And like tonight, you have to talk and tell people of not about yourself, but why this is an exciting project. What is the vision for the project? And the vision is, you know, is about one that emerges out of really back to that point about understanding um, people. This is at Mass Art in Boston. Um, and it was a big brick box. It was an old gym and they wanted to break open this million square feet of art on the block. It's right near, um, it's on sort of the museum row um, near the Gardner Museum. And this became really their threshold to the arts for the mass art community. But I think one of the things I really love about this is bringing design to all of these communities often who might not have that opportunity. And this is a community college and this is a um, Carolina Bell Tower at University, uh, Indiana University. So I could go on and on, but you know, I, I think- um, What's this one? Oh, this is um, the Chippecotta Children's Academy. And this was really, um, for me, a real, really a turning point. Um, I did this with some friends and sort of a really unique, different collaboration, but we'll, we can get into that later. But it's in Zambia and it's in a school in a very rural area where the community built the building. A friend of mine started the school and asked if I would help him to work on this pro bono. So it was a really great project. Very cool, very yeah. cool. Well, we're gonna talk a lot about these different projects as we continue yeah. our interview. So amidst all of these fabulous accomplishments, what would you consider your one or two biggest accomplishments, uh, either personally or professionally? My son, no, um, <laughs> he's great. Um, but um, I would say for me, 
this, uh, the fact I've had the opportunity to have this sustained career and working with um, these wonderful, like great leaders in education and the arts in particular um, and communities and trying to, and making this body of work that is about impact and how it can with just a building that's very conscious and aware and curious about that place can reflect back to a community who they are. You know, whether it was for the Sinatra High School and it was this site that was an old, you know, parking lot. I feel like I'm built in a lot of parking lots. And how do you, like all of a sudden it's like chess. You put it in the right place and it changes a neighborhood. And so, um, you know, and I don't do any of this alone. It's such a collaborative um, effort. Mm -hmm. And um, where I have, you know, just a great team and throughout the years of great partners and collaborators and great clients and all of that working. It makes your life really rich in terms of um, the things and places you get to go. But uh, many of the projects I've done, I have to say, aren't always, they don't begin as extraordinary. They're kind of schools and there's museums that aren't so great that need to be renewed. And how do you bring some real passion and um, commitment? And it's a, it's a lot of hard work, but how do you do that to make impact and change? And so that I guess is what I'm- That's cool. That's very interesting. Proud of. Yeah. yeah, that makes a lot of sense. Yeah. So, so four years ago, you interrupted your partnership and your work with the architectural firm in New York City and went out and founded your own firm. So what motivated this move? Um, I don't know. My partners thought I was nuts. Um, <laughs> they're like, what? I think we need to go out for a drink. Um, I, I think I just, it was 32 years. Um, I was in this partnership. I have to say until the last year, it was with a lot of men, all the brothers I never had. And um, I, I just really needed a, a change. And I think I'd always wanted to try it, to do, have my own uh, practice, um, you know, have my own space. Uh, in, you know, when you're in a large practice, it's a, everything can be a bit of a negotiation. I don't know if it's that different when you have your own, but, mm -hmm. um, but I, the project you asked me about in Africa, that was a really a big turning point for me because I think I'd always stayed with my partnership because I, re I really respected and knew how hard it is to do what we do mm -hmm. and to implement, to, you know, to come up with big ideas, that's my job. And then to really bring it home, it's really important, but that collaboration is huge to do it at a really high level. And when we did this project in um, Africa, I worked with some friends, as I said, we did it pro bono and my friend is a really great builder. And I realized there were different ways to implement that could be about different partnerships for different types of projects, whether the ones in Maine and the firm I partnered with there is amazing. And I can tell you about that more. The, the project in Central Park is my core team, but then I have a partnership with a, another firm who is architect of record. So, you know, but it's a different needs and if different kinds of collaborations. And then that way I could focus my effort really on the type of work I want to do. Um, and in particular, the kind of thing um, about maybe keeping involved, you know, keeping my sleeves rolled up and really being engaged directly in the projects. This is my studio now. I'm actually sitting in it. <laughs> um, everybody's gone, but we started to come back together after COVID. But it, to me, this is a place like a dream come true um, spot. It's in Chelsea, um, right near the High Line. If anybody's heard of that, it's the elevated um, railroad that's turned into a park. Um, and a lot of galleries in this area, um, but we're on the second floor and we just look over 25th street and we have work all over the walls, you know, and it's a really great, just walking in every day. is really exciting. And the team I'm working with is terrific. That's so, awesome. Yeah, that's awesome. Very cool looking space. So it, what advice might you have for other women who might be thinking about branching out onto their, in their own, on their own? And oh. Well, do it. 
but you, you need you need to have you know i i was trying to think just do it you know i guess that's nike um but i have to say that, that having come to this with a really strong track record of projects made this a lot more viable and you know the the fact that i had a lot of you know relationships with um, structural engineers, mechanic, you know, the big consultant team that you work with that are the best in their field. And you, you know, might not have those relationships if you're starting out new. And so that's also really part of the success of any project you do. But I, it's exciting. I mean, it's exciting and a little scary, but you know, it's, I don't know, you just, I, I can't imagine not having done this. It's been really super, um, rewarding and um, but, you know not easy but it's I, I I really think if you bring a passion to what you're doing and a certain kind of expertise um, and you believe in it then I think you can make it happen I'm still trying but I'm working <laughs> Seems like I'm, you're making some I'm working good, on it yeah you're making some pretty doggone good yeah. progress Okay, so let's switch time frames mm -hmm. and states and let's go to Maine and yeah. talk about, can you tell us about your early experiences in Maine? Where did you go? What did you do? Well, I was trying to remember what year. I feel like I was maybe eight or nine or something. And we, um, my parents said we were going to go to Maine. And um, so it was such a fun trip and I couldn't find these pictures I wanted to share. Um, all of us in our, you know, fishing. We went, I remember going particularly to kind of mid coast um, and, you know, being along the water for, sort of from south to north. And then we went in, went to Baxter State Park and we stayed in a lean to. And um, then we hiked what I thought was like the biggest peak, though it turns out it's not quite the, the whole deal. But um, it was absolutely fantastic. And then we did go to um, Acadia. It was sort of, you know, your blueberries for Sal moment. So it must have been July because I remember, you know, picking blueberries um, mm -hmm. along that. But it, you know, it was just a fabulous vacation. And it was all about being in the natural world, which was, it was awe-inspiring. So it left it sort of, it left a real imprint on me. Um, and it was something that I, my parents, I think, really wanted to share with us and to kind of escape the trappings of, you know, more suburban life. Um, although I was born in New York City, we grew up in uh, Connecticut. And um, it was just wonderful to be out there and be with your family and sort of do more daring things. And so that was my <laughs> first, my, that was our first introduction. And then um, I happened to not benefit, but not too long after that, um, my parents started to go um, rent cabins on this island in the Penobscot Bay. And then finally, when I graduated from college, I was a, I had time. I was, you know, always doing other things in the summer on my own. So I went for the first time and, oh, I was hooked. Mm -hmm. I just couldn't believe life on an island. And then, you know, every, your boat, your car, it was fantastic. Um, so that was sort of my introduction. And so my parents, you know, rented these cabins for, I don't know, 30 some odd years. And that was our sort of uh, initial foothold into being wow. there off of Vinyl Haven. So. And then, so the experience evolved as you became an adult for you personally and your mm -hmm. husband. Can you tell us a little bit about that? <laughs> well, I, I um, as we said, uh, when Charlie and I got married, and even before, I think um, we would go, we went up to these cabins. And the, after we got married, we loved going. But we also are major project people, you know, can't sit still, always doing things. And we we're like, wouldn't it be great if we could find a spot here? And again, my father thought we were nuts. And it, like, this is, you know, whatever. And, but we kept looking and um, trying, and we were, um, looking all around Vinyl Haven where we were going. And finally, after sort of looking at lots of spots, this little island came up and we were able to um, convince this woman to sell it to us. 
And um, she did, she was wonderful. She did owner financing and it was like a dream come true. And um, we, over time, and that was 1993. So getting close to, I guess, 28 years ago, um, have built a number of cabins. It's not connected, it's off the grid. Um, you know, I'm, Charlie's the mayor and I'm uh, the head of the water district. <laughs> Um, and so we collect the rainwater off the roofs. Um, so the design of these simple cabins, everything had to come by barge at high tide. And then they had an old truck from China, Maine. It doesn't have, it barely worked, but it brought things to the island. Um, and then it's all um, kit of parts, really. It was um, the Post and Bean Shelter Institute, who's um, right um, near Wiscasset, just south could it be between Bath and Wiscasset, did the timber frame. So I brought a model into their shop, which used to be in Bath, and they um, said, oh, we could do that. And so they built the timber frame and then a local contractor, um, the Conway family built the cabins, everything else about it. And it's been fantastic. Um, and so the water, it looks toward this beautiful sunset. I think every time we say that's more beautiful than the next, and but it's, it's super simple it's just uh, 16 by 40 um and we built a couple of other cabins um over the years um as place for ping pong but i think what's really interesting back to the point about the natural world is that the design was all about collecting the water and maximizing roof area and so you can see in the diagram how under these cabins there are these polypropylene 550 gallon tanks which then provide the water um, we do have a dug well, but that's small, but so we can um, really sustain our both uh, living during summertime here and gardening and all that kind of thing. So it's pretty great, but you can see it's just two simple structures with a little guest house. And then there are a couple of additional buildings um, further in the island. But it, it's just been absolutely fantastic um, for us. And we um, really, enjoy we'll be going on as i said on saturday for two weeks and um you know but everything your boat as earlier i said that your boat's your car and one of the super special thing um which i can i don't know if my pointer shows but to the upper right hand corner is a quarry and um as many people might know final haven was really important um quarrying industry back in the late 19th century and one of my long-term clients in New York has been for many years, um, the Cathedral of St. John the Divine. It's on, on the Upper West Side near Columbia. And the columns at the high altar actually came from this quarry. Mm -hmm. So that really amazing intersection of like personal and professional life. And this is just that uh, one of the columns is actually broke that still um, back uh, 120 some odd years ago, it's still on the shore here. So that's, it's a really great connection for me. Yeah, um, very, yeah. very fun, very yeah. fun. Okay, so uh, congratulations on that really cool personal work. That's very exciting and I can see why you can't wait to get there. <laughs> um, yeah. So beyond that, you've actually done recently three um, professional projects, design projects with nonprofits here in Maine. Um, could you give us a quick overview of those projects? Sure, sure. Um, I think when I started my practice, I was hoping I'd have the chance to do more work in Maine. Mm -hmm. And it's um, so far so good. Mm -hmm. um, the, the three projects, um, actually, I was just up in um, Bar Harbor over the weekend uh, for opening reception. And this is at the College of the Atlantic. What a great place. Um, and could you imagine going to college mm -hmm. on the ocean, the Frenchman's Bay, you know, looking out? It's so magnificent. Anyway, the project is um, a new center for human ecology. I'm working with Opal, which is a great architecture firm in uh, Belfast. And, um, but what I think is really important is why did I get this opportunity? And um, I think that, you know, many people would have loved to do this. And I think the partnership with m my office and Opal sort of brought a sensibility and a, a curiosity and the 
I guess we got it. We got Maine. We got the ethos of this. And there's this is a place that's all about um, living a life that's a responsible one, you know, in the natural world, sense of human ecology. So this building is really their main, going to be their main academic building. And it has everything from zoology for whale dissection, chemistry, physics, um, painting, drawing, um, printmaking, the GIS lab, geology, has even the herbarium from the um, Acadia. It's just this and a greenhouse and it's just awesome. And, but the other thing is, is I got to go to Maine a lot when it was cold and nothing is open except like the big motel next door and you know, everything, it's a really different place. So this building had to be for all seasons, um, which was great, but it's been really um, back to the point of working with great leaders, the president of the college, Darren Collins is just, Great, has a great team and faculty, and you know, students come here for a really particular kind of education, and um, they really live up to that. So it's been great um, through the last four years, really great time. And so, one of the things is that there, it's a building that is actually carbon negative, meaning it gives back. So there's uh, 350 plus, you know. Uh, solar panels on the roof and there's actually an app you can go online and and check it out what it's doing but um, this is all really about a sustainable proposition a building's made almost all out of wood and so anyway I won't go in it's not an architecture talk but um, it's been really great to be able to deliver this kind of building for them and a place back to intersecting with the public realm it's you know it's a college but it's also a place that they want to welcome people you know to share their mission and share their vision um, so I think this is an enabling them to do that very cool yeah. very cool okay next one cabins for the Chuanki Foundation oh this is for girls girls camp girls camp so um, I've been on the board of the Chuanki Foundation oh for a long time and um, <laughs> but you know it was a one of the oldest um, camps in the country, but Chuanki Camp for Boys. And my son went for seven years, I think. And um, then trying, you know, to think about this problem of how to, all the other programs except for the camp um, are co-ed um, at Chuanki. And this was finally an opportunity um, to introduce girls on the neck. Um, Chuanki Neck is this peninsula. Um, and uh, so I was asked if I would be willing, and this is again a pro bono project, um, to design the new girls' cabins. And I said, yes. <laughs> mm -hmm. uh, and this is an um, image of the five first cabins and the um, first you know, group of campers who, they were the first girls that ever slept in these dunks and on June 27th, which is pretty cool. magnificent. This year, just this now. year, because they didn't open because of COVID last year. Oh. So these, all the girls who were in the first session were the first ones ever to sleep in these. And um, so it's, they, each one is named after um, a, um, something important in nature, their birds and one's mm -hmm. called Fiddlehead, um, but it's pretty great. Um, Very cool. Yeah. So um, anyway, Chuanki's awesome. So this is sort of the inside outside. and. We even designed the bunk beds, which was really fun. But I, but I do think like stepping way back, um, this idea of community and importance of climate change, it really impacted how we thought about the cabins because we needed to design them. So there was a place in the middle, like a place to be inside if the weather wasn't as great. And over the last you know 10 years, it's been really very, very different. So how um, being outside is the point and with COVID even more so, but actually being able to be in your pod and have sort of a central space to gather um, has been really helpful for them. Interesting, very interesting insight. Oh, one other thing I think is really fun is um, one of my, sort of my co-chair on the Land and Buildings Committee, Gordy Hall said, he said, Susie, you know, 
what I loved when I was growing up, and he's in probably his early 80s, he said is, I had this little window that I could look out to the natural world. And he said, you got to do that. And so it turned out if you get a lower bunk, bunk, you get a little window, that's sort of cozier. And if you have an upper bunk, then you're sort of in this zone. And I think that's a really special thing um, for the girls to have their own little bit of the natural world from their beds. That's very cool. Thank you for sharing that. That's yeah. interesting. I wouldn't not have known where that came from now that you pointed out. Yeah. It's, it seems like it's a wonderful ad for the campers. Okay, so then we go to Colby College in Waterville. Well, that's a big hole in the ground right now. <laughs> a huge big hole in the ground um, right at the center. And for those of you who are familiar with Waterville um, and its relationship to Colby, um, the the college is doing incredible things to reconnect the college with downtown. So this project is in downtown and it's a collaboration um, with Waterville Creates and Colby College. So it brings um, both the Colby Museum of Art to a gallery, bringing it down the hill, sharing it. Um, it has um, the main international film festival that's just you know, completed in um, July every year it's a really big deal um, and then it has community arts and then it has a big rehearsal space but I think one of the most interesting things about it is you can see it's right downtown it's Main Street and Castongo Square it's such a wonderful old industrial um, city a lot of brick um, and historic fabric um, but this is really returning it but next door is the um, city hall and like a lot of city halls in the turn of the last century um, it, they have an 800 seat theater in the middle of it. And the theater um, is here and really didn't have easy proper access. So if you, I think you go to, there's another image. Yeah. So the, as you turn the corner, it kind of feels like it, from Main Street, it's part of that brick uh, infrastructure and history. You turn the corner and it's facing south onto the green. And then it has this important connection to the theater and it will be accessible. There'll be both the grand stair and an elevator, but the box office is all at the corner um, at Force the Chef Arts, Paul J. Chef Art Center. And so you'll have all these public spaces. And again, maybe this is really answers better your question about intersecting with the public realm. So, you know, at in downtown Waterville, it will be this super generous space um, that's going to, you know, be, you don't have to do anything. You can just come and get, grab a cup of coffee and sit here and students can um, hang out here too. And I think what's um, really interesting that Colby, their initiative, this is just one piece to it. Um, they have a dorm now downtown. They have a new incubator center. They have a new artist um, studio building, green block and studios and a new hotel. So this is gonna be a place where everybody can intersect, you know, that. Watervale's Grand Central Station, um, and you know, get um, go and see a show at the Colby Museum of Art. Go take art classes, go study, um, go meet, and or you know, go to the main International Films Festival. So you can, you know, it's a real mixing bowl of all the activities that go on. So, yeah, I'm definitely on the list to go check it out. Uh, I think <laughs> when next, it's not a big old hole in the ne ground. Yeah, next next fall, I think um, it will fall be. of twenty twenty two. Yeah, that's okay. the end toward the end. Okay, well yeah. that's wow, cool stuff. Lots of good reasons to come to Maine. Yeah, <laughs> no summer, kidding. spring, fall. Yeah, whatever. Um, so amidst all of this work, what would you consider the biggest challenges you faced along the way? Hmm. Over the well, year. yeah, I mean, I think I've alluded to, I mean, doing this work isn't easy. Mm -hmm. um, and um, I think that's, it's a lot, you know, and, but on the other hand, I think it's a challenge, but it's also the reward, mm -hmm. you know, because to, to make anything better takes a lot of work, mm -hmm. a lot of, you know, partnership and just, you know, going to community ports around Central Park for a year, you know, going to community meetings, going, but also, you know, you have to work really hard at convincing people to 
make change and change can be hard. Um, but it's so, it is so satisfying on the other side of it when they say, you know, I wasn't sure about this, but this is great. Mm -hmm. And so both those things come together, I think, to, um, yeah, yeah, make it all worthwhile, right? <laughs> Well, as you, as we talked, I mean, intersecting the public realm, mean, realm means you intersect the public and the yep. public is not easy. And no, you're reinforcing and, that. <laughs> yeah, no, it's, it's true. And um, yeah, and I, I think that's where you have to be open and mm -hmm. listen, because I think you can absorb a lot of big things and actually lots of little things that can add up to changing the direction of a design. Um, but part of it is also not having it all cooked right in the beginning. It's not like here it is. It's um, about listening and learning and leading that, you know, and then we have to do our work. Um, but, but, but I do think, you know, you, you can learn a ton from these public meetings and really understand the culture, the vibe, what might be a little different than when you first began, you know, and the, if you're interested in researching and becoming familiar, then you can actually sometimes share back things that the people who are really familiar with home don't, don't realize, you know, it's almost being, you know, it's like being a tourist in your own city. You're like, oh, I never knew this was here. Mm -hmm. And you can start to, ref if a building back to the point about portraiture is really truly about the place, the client, not about me. It's not about me at all. It's, mm -hmm. But my job is how do I interpret all of that information mm -hmm. and synthesize it and bring it all together. Um, so fascinating. Very real. Okay, so that's obviously my next question is about professional or person lessons learned along the way that you'd like to share with, with our audience and that they might be able to apply to their own lives. At some level, you just answered that question. And the, one of the answers is what you just talked about, but mm -hmm. any other thoughts that come to mind? Um, I, hmm, something important. Um, <laughs> I mean, I, I think I, I've probably said it. I mean, I, I, I do think you, I think it's important to be good at what you do. You know, I, I think that um, that's all that matters because then you can make it make a difference. Mm -hmm. um, and I remember, I don't know why this is coming to me, but I remember going to a talk um, by this man. He was, spoke zillions of languages. He was an astronaut. He was a nuclear physicist, all this stuff. And he, but he started to talk about, you know, connecting and, you know, I thought, where is this going? And he was one on the, he had to go up to the mirror mm -hmm. and he had to, um, work with, he had to learn Russian to do this so he could collaborate. And I guess that it was pretty much of a big jalopy up there in the sky. And they had um, some major um, technical problems, you know, life-threatening type of problems. And, you know, I was like, where is this going? Where is and he said, you know, however nice I could be or whatever, it's all that mattered is that I knew what I was doing because I being all the expertise he brought kept them alive. Mm -hmm. and re repaired this and you know I, I think in the end we need expertise is really really important and expertise mm -hmm. balanced with I think um, c care concern you know and responsibility mm -hmm. and and uh, I think a big, big part of it is you have to have a sense of humor because if you don't it's like really can be super hard <laughs> very hard to get through any of it yes yeah, okay so yeah. is there any other advice you might offer um, to women who are going into male dominated fields like architecture was when you entered it and perhaps still is? I don't, mm. I don't know how it plays out. Well, that's where that sense of humor comes back. <laughs> um, so um, not all men are the same. That's an important thing to know. Um, but I guess just don't think about it so much. I, I think back to just be really good at what you do and love what you do and be focused on, I don't know if it's the right answer, but it's how I've, I managed. Um, you can imagine having 10 male partners at times, that was a lot. Um, but, you know, everybody's a person, you know, and finding, um, finding 
partnerships with people, um, men or women, is, is really, really important. You know, and I, I would say, though, when my mentor um, in all of, you know, who I met when I was in graduate school, he was the dean of, the, of Columbia, Jim Polshek. He loves Maine, too. Um, and uh, judgment on his part. Yeah, no, actually, it was sort of interesting how her whole group loved Maine. Um, but he went more north than me. Mm -hmm. But he, you know, finding people who will give you a shot for women, I think I'm, you can't tell, but I'm five feet tall. So um, I'm, you know, opinionated five foot tall person, but um, he gave me a shot at this. He mm -hmm. said, you can do this. And, you know, finding people who you can work with, who can believe in you to give you that opportunity, because without the opportunity, you can't do anything, you know? And so that's trying to find those opportunities or make them somehow. I think that that's super important. Um, and, you know, I, I'm so thankful, you know, and throughout the years, you know, you actually think about whether they're real mentors or some of the clients that you had throughout the years who let you, you know, um, have this opportunity to work with them and collaborate to make things, to make a difference, so. Cool. Okay, cool, makes sense. So what are your forward-looking aspirations at this point? Um, spend more time in Maine, <laughs> do more work in Maine. <laughs> um, no, I, I, I think that's always one of the pits that we get in our, my husband, Charlie and I get in our stomach when we have to leave and we're like, why are we leaving? <laughs> and so, um, yeah, just trying to make that possible because it's, mm -hmm. it's everybody, all of you know, it's a really special, place and its culture is not monolithic in any way either. Well, I think some people put that uh, umbrella over it, but um, found that working with these different institutions, um, there is connection between the, 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 the geography of the state. Mm -hmm. But, you know, there, it's, there are different places and I think there's a sense of, you know, hard work. One of the things I find that I really value, and I learned a lot, it influenced um, the way I think about architecture is the kind of working waterfront in particular where I've been and how things have to work. So things have to be beautiful and how creativity can grow out of um, solving problems. Like Clarence Conway, who um, was now in his um, mid eighties, but he built our original cabins and he'd had all these fantastic little things. He'd come up, Suze, you know, we can do this. And, you know, just being clever with ordinary things. So that's like another thing too, is you don't have to travel around the world or, you know, it's wonderful, but you can find, make extraordinary things out of very simple things. Mm -hmm. And I think that's also really rewarding. So. Very helpful, very interesting. Okay, so that's the end of the official questions. Uh -huh. okay. um, we have one question that came in ahead of time, and that is a question of the, uh, someone asked, do you have a signature style? No, <laughs> um, but that, that's too simple an answer. Um, I don't think about it like that. Mm -hmm. um, I, think, I think that the design emerge, I have, I'd say I have a process mm -hmm. that, um, encompasses getting, you know, how do you get there? But um, I think the results are not known <laughs> when right. you start. Right. And so I think if you wanna go on that journey, um, some people would like to know this is what you're buying, this thing. Mm -hmm. I sort of think that's more like shopping. And I think design <laughs> is something that needs to um, fuse itself with the place. And it makes you more aware of where you are whether it's how you cite a building, how its uh, form and mass uh, responds to the wind and the light and the program. You know, I, I think what we do is very much about a puzzle, solving a puzzle. Mm -hmm. So I think trying to understand that, you know, so maybe the analogy is to cooking. Okay, so every school has pretty much the same thing in it. It has, you know, a gym, it has a cafeteria, it has a, a classrooms, it has art rooms, you know, it has whatever, same stuff, but how it's like cooking, 
but how do you put it all together can make it really quite delicious or not so good. Um, And so that's where I think that you learn and that's where you can bring um, those things to uh, making that place really special. So very cool, very good insight. Um, So Allie, my buddy behind the scenes, do we have any other questions that have come in in the chat? We sure do. And I encourage our guests to um, add more to the Q&A uh, button at the, at the bottom of the screen. Um, but we'll get started. The first one came in, and I think we've actually already touched on it quite a bit, uh, mm-hmm. Susan, but it's, you know, what are some of the difficult things you've gone through where our guests might be able to learn something from it? Well, you know, I think since we're um, mostly probably amongst women, I think, and you know, if you're starting out in this, I think that whatever you do, I don't, it's not unique to architecture, but I think it's, a, you know, work is, is, there's a lot of time you have to spend. So um, it's really consuming. And so I think having a partner in that journey is really important. Somebody who shares the, the, the work of life, you know, that, and making, making your, um, work part of your life, I think is really something that um, is a, important. So, you know, but I think, you know, my partnership with my husband, we've been married 35 years, you know, is pretty, been pretty fundamental to, you know, making it all happen and supporting each other in whatever you do. Um, so maybe that's one thing that comes to mind. Great, thank you. Um, you talked about convincing people to make change. Mm-hmm. How do you find your voice and confidence when dealing with the public? Well, I, I believe that I need to know a lot about who I'm talking to, um, to gain their trust. So um, you wouldn't go to a surgeon who wasn't familiar with whatever was wrong with you. Um, And I think in some ways, I'm not um, coining this phrase, but talk about what we do is sort of can be like surgery, especially when you're transforming an existing building or an existing place. (laughs) So, um, but I I believe that you have to be really informed. You have to do your homework. You have to know what you're talking about. You have to know what are the issues and understand, you know, both the physical and the political and the historical. I mean, history is super important. What we do as architects is like um, overlay on something that has gone before. So if you um, don't know what your, where it is, what happened, you could be, what you could be doing would be so inappropriate but you, you really need to like build from that understanding in that place to, to either be super radical or something that's more quiet. But I don't think you can define that until you understand the context in which you are um, working with and understanding what people are really trying to accomplish by that. And then also knowing that not everybody agrees. So trying to bring people about a bigger vision that isn't my vision, but it's one that is about pulling together all of these pieces. Um, so, and trust isn't about just trust me. That's why I wish I could say that, but it's more about, um, I understand and this is the opportunities, you know, possible. So I hope Excellent. that answers. <laughs> Sorry. It, it worked for me. Okay. <laughs> Um, how did you foster your mentorship relationships over the years? And this doesn't specify whether you were the mentee or the mentor. So I'd be curious, I guess, for both. Well, I think from Jim, I learned how important it was and it's been really important. I've done a lot of teaching over the years. So, um, you know, your students become, um, people that are with you. If you really connect for a long time, you know, I, began right in the late 80s. I taught at City College in, um, for five years. And so I was just had lunch the other day with one of my students who ended up transferring to Cornell and she and a friend were very much came to work with me at my practice. And um, 
but I, I think it's sticking with it, you know, and again, convincing I, uh, somebody who works with me now, I've known since she was in high school and she really wanted to be an architect and she's just been amazing. And so I think, and then another person worked with me um, in my former practice and brought them along. And I think it's all about getting people to believe in themselves and to giving them again, opportunities to be part of things. And I, again, I learned that so much from Jim and what he was able to do for me. So, you know, I think that's another thing we should all do is um, help people, you know, to it. And again, men or women, um, I think it's really, really important. Oh, I have to say this one thing. I was at an event the other night and it was, um, I've been on the board of the Architectural League of New York for a very long time. And every year there's a president's medal and we honor somebody and quite important people, whether, you know, at one time it was the Aga Khan a few years ago and Mike Bloomberg and then lots of really important people who care about design. And this year we honored um, a man who's a landscape architect and um, artist, Walter Hood um, in, on the West Coast. And because of COVID, we didn't do it inside and sort of a stuffy dinner, we did it in the public park. And it was in Harlem, it was fantastic. And when one of the people who honored and spoke about him, he said, you are our ancestors wildest dream. And to me to that is just such a big compliment. And I think we should all aspire to be our ancestors wildest dreams and whether it's in small things or big things, but I was like, oh, it, it was really, um, I just realized the responsibility of what it is to do whatever work we do, not just design, so. That's amazing. That's, that's, that is an amazing, uh, an amazing quote. Um, okay, so this is, a, a, how, is how, has COVID, how has COVID impacted your work? Ugh, COVID, ugh. Ugh, I know. Ugh. <laughs> Um, we make a lot of these, I call them silly string drawings on the computer um, with Zoom and GoTo and, you know, trying to design on the computer with people to sketch and stuff is very hard. But anyway, um, March, was it 19th? I can't remember. Uh, that Friday, we all left the, stu the studio and um, for, you know, not until like a month. A couple of months ago, people started to come back. So I um, was in my COVID studio. I have a space at home, um, which was really lucky that I had that space and I could work, work there. But I started to come back in September, um, myself and one of my colleagues. And um, what I did is I'm a city bike rider. So I would, we'd ride all the way through the winter, um, back and forth. Um, it's about two and a half miles on city bike. And um, it made it better. And then we'd, we'd still bring, it, we, we're only eight of us. So it's a small studio. Um, and I, my team dispersed for a while, you know, Calgary, Wisconsin, um, Michigan, South Carolina, Brooklyn, Brooklyn, um, I'm trying to get New Jersey, Upper Manhattan, you know, so everybody was away and now some are still a few are still away but most everybody's come back um and yeah it's been really hard and the other thing was hard is i couldn't go to any of my job sites so luckily i had great partnerships and you know people up in maine who could go um with um, tim block from opal and his team but yeah it was really it's it's hard and it's not over yet you know um and so I, I don't know, just being careful and everybody needs to get vaccinated. Um, super, I got COVID too. So that wasn't great on inauguration day. It was supposed to be a great day. <laughs> it was, except I also got COVID, but anyway. Wow. Yeah. Um, what principles or values guide how you work with your team and manage the business? Mm. I guess the first thing I think of is transparency. Um, I think we're in an open studio. I should probably move my camera. Well, you saw the picture. Um, there's not a lot that they don't, people don't hear about um, in terms of um, how we transact our business and how 
um, the nature of the work we do is also really important, I think, um, that, we, that we select to, to do. And, um, and the values of, you know, involving, I don't know if these are values, but giving everybody a chance to be part of um, the process, which is really invaluable. Um, I'm not answering this very well, um, but I, I, I guess I, we talk a lot about our responsibility in the public realm and working and how we need to spend our time um, to create new and um, better lives for people through the work we do. Um, so I think that just undergirds everything um, that we do. And, and I, I guess spending a lot of time listening and talking and sharing ideas um, makes it, it's, you know, there's a lot of people a lot younger than I am here. So I think uh, that is a really important dialogue um, to bring. And there's a lot going, you know, the world is so different, in, you know, um, issues of diversity, equity, and inclusion are so important to the work we do. And we, talk, we talk, just talk about this all the time. And I think being in an open studio environment, you can really share, share these concerns and how our work could Im improve things. Um, so I know it's a big question uh, to ask. And you know the issues of how COVID has affected the, the um, greater population um, and not very, evenly. And so again, how we can be part of that, uh, make the world a better place. Very simple. Yeah. So we're up against time and yeah. we didn't, we didn't get to answer, answer all the questions, but here's one that came in the chat, which I think is great, which is what mindset or attitude do you wake up with every morning? Depends if it's Monday or Wednesday. <laughs> um, <laughs> Uh, but mindset, that's a really, that's an interesting question. Um, I guess it, it, it's different. I, I, I'm not, this isn't gonna be a very good answer. I, it depends. Generally, I, I think I am an optimist. So I think you have to be, we all need to be. Um, so I'm always trying to think about how, um, yeah, just, I try to recalibrate every morning, just how can we do our work, you know, better in terms of uh, this and just trying to also enjoy, trying to think about how to enjoy life. <laughs> That's a really important part. That's why I really like to ride city bike to work in the morning because I ride along the Hudson River and it's like, um, I can't be in Maine, so I can do that and I can connect to, um, um, the natural world and think about that. So probably not the most profound answer, but I think being an optimist is really important and um, thinking about other people and how you impact them and engage with them. So. Well, okay, so that's certainly consistent with other things you've said this evening. <laughs> um, and so that brings us to the end of this evening. Um, thank you so much for joining us. You've had quite the journey of creativity, of conscientiousness, of making an impact, and beautiful design that you've shared with us. Very, very interesting. I really want, I for sure want to see four different places in Maine now. The three you've designed, well, the four you've designed, including mm. that little island of yours. <laughs> yeah. Figure out how to get out there and check it out. Um, so good luck with all your future endeavors and getting to Maine a whole lot more. Thank you so much, <laughs> Nancy. Thank you. And good, you know, and I um, feel really um, honored to be part of this group of women. It's, you've had so many interesting people and I look forward to actually benefiting from listening to more. So thanks. Oh, well, thank you. Uh, thank you to you and thank you to everybody who joined us tonight. Um, we hope we'll see you again at our next We Are Me series interview, which will actually not happen until January of 2022. Between now and then, 
um, as we mentioned early, as, as uh, Ellen brought up, uh, the Maine Women's Conference, um, our third, um, will be happening November 8th to 10th, 2021. It will be virtual. So uh, people from, we're hoping women from all across Maine and beyond as are interested will join us for this exciting gathering of women. It will include a whole bunch of new ideas, connecting with ideas, connecting with other participants, uh, connecting with our speakers. Um, it, the, the theme is actually growing through connection. So um, that's what's going on throughout the three day period. Um, we also encourage you to follow the Maine Women's Conference on your various social media, our, our various social media challenges, channels, sorry, and stay up to date through our website if that's of interest to you. Um, and we'd love to hear from you about what you thought of this session. And if you have other ideas of women uh, that meet our criteria um, that you think we should be interviewing as we get into 2022, we'd love to hear about it. Um, and again, thank you for joining us, Susie. Thank the you. Women on the call, the women who listen to this uh, separately because we are recording it. So we will be sending uh, the recording out to anyone who registered for the event and beyond. It will be posted on our website. Um, we hope we have you leaving tonight feeling inspired, empowered, educated, and connected with fellow women Mainers, as well as others who are involved with what we're up to. Good evening, everybody. Have a good Bye -bye. evening.